Hello, and thank you for joining us for the Inside ODOT podcast. I'm Liz McIntyre from ODOT Communications and your host for today's episode. In this episode, you'll hear ways that ODOT staff help prevent human trafficking through education and partnerships with the trucking community. And with construction beginning fall 2024, ODOT staff and consultants prepare to restore two viaducts along historic Columbia River Highway. And lastly, Paris Edwards, climate change adaptation and resilience specialist, talks with Matt Noble about how the new climate adaptation and resilience roadmap will prepare us for extreme weather. Welcome, and let's get started. Human trafficking can happen anywhere, including on our transportation system. An ODOT motor carrier enforcement officer shares how educating our staff and building relationships with our trucking partners helps prevent human trafficking. So as officers, we take a human trafficking class and we get to hear from a survivor of human trafficking and they share a lot of information that we don't know. We partner with local truck stops. We have posters that we put up. We involve our local law enforcement and any inspectors are welcome to use our scales to do truck inspections and have interaction with drivers and hand out material. All of that is super important because truckers are really one of the first lines of defense. They're on the road constantly. They see more than we sometimes can at the scales. What does it take to restore a 100-year-old viaduct? ODOT staff and consultants provide an update on how two historic viaducts will be repaired on the historic Columbia River Highway. We are preserving the rich history of the gorge by restoring the historic Columbia River Highway on both sides of Multnomah Falls. During restoration, sections of the highway will be closed from late 2024 to early 2026. The historic Columbia River Highway, originally known as the Columbia River Highway, dates from 1913. At the time, folks saw it as America's great highway, the king of roads. It's the first scenic highway in in America. There were challenges in building the historic highway to get access to Multnomah Falls. There was not a lot of room between the railroad and the cliffs that are to the south. The solution then was to build these viaducts, build them up and hug tight against the cliffs and that way there'd be enough room to build them between the cliffs and the railroad. There are lots of elements to the Multnomah Falls viaducts that make them unique. First off, they're over 100 years old. There's an arch railing on the viaducts, a very thin concrete railing that's unique to the area and really stands out with the natural setting. On the approaches of Multnomah Falls viaducts, there are stone masonry walls. They were handcrafted by masons 100 years ago, each stone intricately shaped. A very unique structural wall that's stacked very beautifully and very stable in its current state. We generally build bridges to have a 75 year lifespan. And so we are well beyond that. The viaducts have taken a beating over time and need some TLC. So we're really looking forward to rehabilitating the viaducts. The repairs are going to extend the life of the structures so that there's minimal maintenance required over the next 50 years. The viaducts are gonna stay the same width. A lot of the rehabilitation work, most of it's gonna occur underneath. The asphalt's going to be removed and we're gonna put a new concrete deck on it. We're gonna keep the railing there, but we're gonna do some repair work on it and put a coating on it. So it might pop a little bit more at the end of construction. Repair work by nature is slow and tedious. Another challenge is that the railroad is right next to the viaducts. And so there'll be a lot of coordination with the railroad to keep the workers safe and have a safe working environment during the project. We really need to be able to accommodate folks during construction and make sure that people know how best to access the falls while the viaducts are under construction. The first year, the West Viaduct will be closed. The second year, the East Viaduct will close. There'll be very clear signage on where to go and how to access the falls. I would also just recommend parking at the I-84 lot, which may be different than how folks have accessed it in the past, or take our transit service. It's one connection from Cascade Lux or from Gateway Transit Center. It's the best way to visit the falls because then you don't have to worry about parking. Stay informed and know before you go. Learn more about our gorge work.
When Oregon experiences an extreme weather event, we see more damaged roads and closures, more money and time spent repairing our infrastructure, and more communities temporarily cut off from critical services. Paris Edwards, climate change adaptation and resilience specialist, joins us to talk about ODOT's new climate adaptation and resilience roadmap and how our agency will turn those strategies and recommendations into operational realities. I'm joined today by a member of the Climate Change Adaptation and Resilience Team at ODOT. She is a climate adaptation specialist. Paris Edwards, thank you for joining me today on the Inside ODOT podcast. It's great to be here. Hi, Matt. Hi, Paris. Like I said, thank you for taking the time to sit down with me today. Obviously, we're doing this over Microsoft Teams, but I wanted to talk to you today about the Climate Adaptation and Resilience Roadmap. So a couple of questions for you to help explain to the agency about what it is, what it does, and how it'll help us improve our work moving into the future. So I like to set the stage for the audience with how climate change is affecting Oregon's transportation system. So what have we been seeing over the past several years, and what do we expect to see in the future? Good questions. We've seen a shift from event seasons to more of a constant flow of events that are just more often coming back to back or happening at the same time. We're seeing also just more extreme events. So I have in mind the Eagle Creek fires in 2017, then we had those really intense historical fires in 2020. A few months later, we had some extreme ice storms and snowstorms that just seriously disrupted transportation. We lost power for, gosh, it was like hundreds of thousands of Oregonians. And then we had a deadly heat dome the following summer. So it's been a lot. It's picking up pace. Uh, it hasn't escaped our lives. And these events really, they pose a lot of challenges for us as an agency. It stretches us really thin personally and just collectively. Events are also really, really expensive. The cost can be long lasting, not just immediate too. So all this just really changes and challenges us to be able to deliver on our mission to provide safe and reliable multimodal system into the future. Yeah, thank you for that setup. I think you painted a really uh, vivid picture. And I think no matter where people live in Oregon, they have been affected in some way by a lot of those extreme weather events that you that you laid out. So it's very prescient. And uh, with all that in mind, could you please give us a summary of what the roadmap is? Because judging by its name, the Climate Adaptation and Resilience Roadmap, it sounds like it, would, it will help us deal with the challenges presented by all that extreme weather that we've all been experiencing. Yeah, well, that's the hope. So the roadmap it includes a lot of information, but it's primarily focused on looking at climate change risk. And we can do that actually at the corridor scale for the entire state highway system, which is pretty cool. It includes a deep dive into costs from climate hazards. We really looked at the system-wide costs and also dug into regional costs. And it provides us a, a set of strategies and actions that we can take as an agency to become more resilient to climate change. And that element in particular is kind of focusing on our path forward and sets us up well for implementing and really doing something about it. Cool. Thank you for that succinct breakdown. And one follow-up in that same vein. I know back in January this year, the Oregon Transportation Commission officially adopted the roadmap at their January meeting. And I was hoping you can give us a better sense of what that means. So is it some sort of binding document now? Is that what adoption means? Or, or how is that? how will that affect our work moving forward? The short answer is yes. Adoption from the OTC means that we, we really have a green light from the highest levels of state transportation leadership to move forward on implementing those strategies and actions that I mentioned for building resilience. Okay, thank you. That makes That makes more sense now to me. So reading through the actual roadmap document, I noticed that one of the key features of the roadmap is what you guys call a statewide climate risk hazard assessment. Could you please tell us more about how it functions in the roadmap and how it will help the agency? So I'll broaden it a little bit and say that the, the roadmap summarizes risk to nine different climate hazards that we know are relevant to Oregon. And we 
are able to look at where those hazards are likely to strike the state highway system at a corridor scale. So we can look at risk statewide, and then we can also zoom into each region to get a better picture of that risk broadly. So understanding that level of risk and, and where those are located, it allows us to start to prioritize our work and really do that prioritization based on where we need it most. And it helps us, of course, plan ahead. We can design, build, and make repairs that take into account a specific location's climate hazard challenges. So paying attention to those place-specific vulnerabilities is really how we're going to continue to have a resilient transportation system into the future. And Paris, uh, just a short aside question for you. Uh, what is the difference between a climate hazard and extreme weather? I mean, I think we can all picture extreme weather as like wildfires and flooding, if that's correct. But what is a climate hazard and how do they interact? That's a great question. It's not always clear. The way we differentiate is to say that climate hazards are caused by extreme weather. A good example would be landslides. They are caused by, in many cases, extreme precipitation. Sometimes that extreme precipitation is made more hazardous because of previous fire. A lot of these issues are interlinked. But that's one example of, of a hazard that's not at all a weather event. Okay, so if, if a climate hazard is caused by extreme weather, then, for example, wildfires are a climate hazard that are in part caused by uh, extreme or very high heat. Is that correct? Yes, and, of course, ongoing drought, which in Oregon has been going on for decades. Of course, good addition. Okay, so that risk assessment piece of the roadmap sounds incredibly useful, so I'm glad uh, you guys have that in there. And I know that there is also a map component of those climate risk hazard assessments, so could you please elaborate a little more on those maps and what they are, and more importantly, where staff can find them? So, first of all, staff can access the maps three different ways. We have an ArcGIS online map. It's really easy to share with external partners, and it has the most complete set of climate data layers. We have asset condition. We've got the local road system in there, highway mile points, of course. We have our uh, ODOT social equity data and many, many other layers that can be overlaid with the climate data to tell just a more complete story of resilience. We also have the corridor scale climate hazard risk information in the FACTS STIP tool and in TransGIS. Uh, and you can find those in the new planning and climate resilience menus. Same name for both of those tools. We also build a SharePoint page for staff, and it links to all those map tools. There's a guidance document and a how-to video. It's really meant to be a one-stop shop for all things roadmap related. You can even find the document there and a shorter executive summary. And we have some great helpful fact sheets all about hazards it kind of goes into detail about recent impacts to the system, what are some potential solutions, barriers to the solutions, all really helpful information for folks who are curious to learn more. Cool. Yeah, it seems like you guys have uh, your bases covered about resources for staff. Could you just talk briefly about what purpose the maps serve and what staff can uh, look forward to when they uh, seek them out? Yeah, thanks for that. So the vision is really to be able to look at a project location scale what are the relevant climate hazards? We want to be able to look kind of in a crystal ball fashion into the future a little bit to say, okay, we know what's hitting us now. We want to know a little bit about how the life of this, say, piece of infrastructure and asset is going to endure in the face of increasing frequency and intensity of the existing events, and then in a lot of cases, more in different types of hazards. So this map allows us to zoom in, look at a project location, and then speak to all the disciplines across ODOT to basically integrate that information to everything we do from designing it, building it, the materials we use, how we build it, where we build it. That's now a lot easier to do. It's going to help us keep things out of harm's way and have longer lasting infrastructure that we don't have to maintain as much, um, which is incredibly important right now financially. Yeah, definitely. And something you just said really stuck out to me, and that is uh, how the roadmap is going to integrate with so much of the work we do in many corners of the agency. So listening to how thorough the roadmap is, it sounds like it took a small army of people to help you uh, create it. Could you please talk about that process and who you involved? Yeah, this is very much a group effort. 
And it's it's also really an internal ODOT specific document. We informed it with a very good balance of input from across the agency. We also looked at best practices across DOTs and, of course, dug into the scientific expertise. So on the internal side, we held regional interviews and we talked to a lot of different disciplines. So we were speaking with engineers, people who work in maintenance, people who work in leadership, people who work in communications like yourself. And we really got a lot of detail about what, from their perspective, are our resilience strengths and weaknesses. We use those conversations to develop and vet the roadmaps list of strategies. Our adaptation team also did a lot of research just to make sure that we're capturing the best practices within those strategies and actions so that we as an agency are aligned with the successful resilience efforts that other DOTs are putting into place. And in addition to that, we, we hired some external expertise. So we had a consultant that provided that climate change projection data and our climate hazard cost analysis. So this, this was truly a, a one dot effort. That's really encouraging to hear. I know um, the enthusiasm you just spoke about uh, was especially encouraging. And I know extreme weather and climate risks and all the essentially all the stuff this roadmap talks about, I just feel like it's going to touch so many corners of the agency and affect so many of our daily jobs in small ways, possibly even medium and big ways moving forward, depending on what you do. So it's it's very uh, heartening to hear that so many people had a hand in this and that they were all just stoked to be a part of it and to uh, you know contribute and make it what it is today. So again, just you know, it's almost like I write these questions in advance to segue into uh, my penultimate question is so what's next? So the roadmap is written, it's been adopted by the OTC, and so I assume some sort of implementation is in its future. Absolutely. So this is the part I'm really excited to talk about. You know, our next step is is really working with staff to carry out the strategies and actions that we set in the roadmap. The the current strategy list is really focused on a one to five year timeline. So we'll be working with the appropriate staff to just diligently address each one of those, but really in a collaborative sense. So in a lot of these strategies, they really build on each other. So what we have kind of laid out now is the top of the list to tackle. And some of these are actually already underway. For example, integrating the roadmap into some of these key agency policies is is really critical in order for ODOT staff to kind of have the direction they need to take action. We're making progress on that by including the roadmap by reference in the newly adopted Oregon Transportation Plan. So we'll be reaching out to groups going forward uh, and individuals who play really key roles in the success of each of the strategies, and we'll be working with them to develop short-term work plans. But broadly, you know, this is a living document that will need to be updated over time to reflect the evolving resilience needs and our accomplishments over time. And I'd add to that, when something significant like new climate data comes available, the roadmaps, risk information, and the map tools will be updated to reflect that new information. Awesome. That all sounds really excellent. And I, for one, am looking forward to it, as I'm sure many people are in the agency. But Paris, that really does it for our conversation. Is there anything that uh, we didn't cover that you'd like to add in or anything you'd like to leave our listeners with in regards to the roadmap? Yeah, I'd love for people to know that the roadmap is designed to be practical and reader friendly. You know, we don't necessarily expect anyone to read it cover to cover. There's a lot of useful information in there, starting with glossary of terms, just to get folks more familiar with any of the terms they heard today and more. Also, if if people are interested in a particular hazard type or a particular region, it's easy to find what you're looking for in the document. We made it really easy to jump around with links to get people from chapter to chapter. So I encourage people to just explore it a bit. And really, ultimately, I guess I'll leave folks with saying, this is a great handbook for what we face as an agency and where we can go from here. Yeah, definitely. That was also the takeaway that I got uh, reading through the document when I was preparing to talk to you today. And Yeah, I think it's going to be an important tool for us at the agency to uh, really meet this climate change emergency at this point moving forward. Yeah, which is really lovely to uh, talk to you today, Paris. Your enthusiasm for this document and all things climate is very infectious. So I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about the roadmap today. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for taking the time to speak with me, giving me a chance to really introduce this to a broader audience. And I really encourage people to reach out to me individually and our team broadly. We really would love to work closely with anyone who's interested in knowing more about the work uh, and being interested in doing some of this work.
You have been listening to the Oregon Department of Transportation's Inside ODOT podcast. If you'd like to learn more about these topics or read this month's news stories, you can find links on our show notes page. If you have story suggestions or any feedback for us, hit us up at the Inside ODOT mailbox. Until then, I'm Liz McIntyre. Safe travels, everyone. <laughs>